Welcome to LACA's Talking Art series, or TAS for short, and we're delighted that the very first TAS talk will be with Viv Laws, Programme Director of LACA, and Sylvain Levy of the Dominic Sylvain Levy Collection of Chinese Contemporary Art with a digital emphasis. And we hope that you enjoy this talk and future LACA TAS talks. Hello, Syl Sylvan. Uh, very nice to see you. And I just want to start by introducing the very basics of your collection. So your collection is called the DSL Collection for Dominic and Sylvan Levy. Uh, you and your wife, you started this collection many years ago. Uh, the DSL Collection, we know, has been a, a formal collection since 2005. But was it immediately uh, conceived as a collection that would be accessible to uh, anyone who, who, who chose to have access or at what point in your collecting history, which I, I understand goes back about 30 years, did you decide that it really should be a formal collection? Now it comes with, with the DSL collection. Uh, with the DSL collection we decided that uh, we wanted to collect differently than uh, what we've been doing and especially to, to try to open the collection to the public. And uh, because we thought that uh, sharing our experience of a Chinese contemporary art collection could be uh, worse uh, for uh, Western people, mm -hmm. but also for Chinese people, uh, because it's interesting for Chinese people to have a, a Western point of view on, on their art. And so we decided that we wanted to share the collection and it was the time of YouTube and we said, uh, let's look at what we can do with the internet. And that's yeah. how we went to, uh, we put the collection on the internet in 2005. Excellent. Um, and your works, uh, it's limited to 350 artworks in your collection. Is that still the case? That was the, the, the founding concept in 2005. Is it still 350? The founding concept was 220 works. Oh, from I From the beginning. Okay. But but we moved to 350 because we have added uh, Hong Kong and the uh -huh. ink, contemporary ink section. But we, we, are, we are focused, now it's finished, we stuck with, three, with, with the idea of 350s and we, we change 5 to 10% every year. Okay, so, that, so, that, so you do sell works, you know, and, and then, or, mo or move them on somehow and, and add to them. So it's not a static collection completely, but, it's, static, it's, but it's limited. Slow. It's, it's a, slow, a slow change. Okay, so let's now, now, now talk in more detail. I really want to get that sense of how you think about things and, and, and your view as a collector on this, this fourth industrial revolution and the, and the nature of art within it. Uh, and obviously you, you specialize, your, your collection is focused on Chinese contemporary art, but, but many of the same considerations apply regardless of where you where you choose to collect and in fact it is art without borders i know that that's that's one of the phrases that's often attached to the dsl collection so uh, this is this is something that's that's about technology and the interaction between art and technology so uh, let me ask you your first question is um do you think that art and technology have completely changed the way we look what should the 21st century collector try to do with their collection? And I think, I think that's what, what the, the question we're coming to is, is what's the purpose? And so the nature of purpose in itself is something we should question. Does it need a purpose? I think for me in a collection, there is two, I should say, two assets in a collection, especially mm. in a private collection. I, I speak of private collection, private yeah. collection. Yeah. I don't speak of museums. I speak of uh, private collections. I think there are two types of assets in a collection. I shall say tangible assets, which are the artworks, and intangible asset, which is uh, based, which are based on the story of the collectors and how the collection, the collection has been built together. Mm. And other thing is in this intangible is how you create a brand which can be relevant, timely and timelessness. Yeah. And which links you to other 
types of fields like the luxury model, mm. or like uh, technology, like sociology with the transformation of the society, the social transformation. So I think that today a collection is not for me only about tangible assets. And the intangible part of a collection would become more and more important in the future. So, I mean, you know, the nature of tangibility, when we're talking about uh, the DSL collection and the, 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 the tangibility is through the virtual world. So how do you see tangibility, the very notion of it, that being able to touch, how do you see that playing out as a concept in, in VR? First, I think that uh, we have this kind of image of being just a digital collection, but it's, we know we have a lot of works, physical works, and we know we, we learned a lot of works. I'm going in, in, in Zurich in the 10th of September because we are learning a work there. We are moving in the digital space, okay. physical and digital, yeah. but we don't want to have a space that we own and manage. Mm. This is the, uh, the idea because we think that since the beginning of this collection, we think that we have to embrace a kind of nomadic spirit mm. and not just to be fixed to something. Coming back to what you said, I think that uh, for me, the virtual world is another real world. It's not virtual. I think that today, what we speak of virtuality is no more virtuality. It's mm. part of the world of the people. They yeah. move today from their screen yeah. to the offline to the online yeah. in a very natural way. And there is no distanciations between, and there is no, there is no difference between buying today on, for instance, buying today on the internet or buying physically today in a shop. I mean, and, that... more and, more, and more and more, and especially with the young generation, the difference between what is called virtual and what is called real world mm. will not exist because there will be two different, two different realities. This is what I think. Okay, and, and, and by saying there are two different realities, you, uh, you're, you're making a conceptual shift to those realities being of equal importance. It's not about doing away with the physical experience of a museum or a, you know, an, an accessible physical collection, but about the equality between the two and the lack of boundaries, the fluidity between the two. This is what you're, you env envisage as being something that's already well on its way and, and getting faster and faster then. You know, it's very interesting because in 2014, I wrote an article for Art Asian uh, Pacific and uh, and I will send you the article. Mm. And uh, it was about this subject. And I was asking, questioning, what is the value of a digital visitor? When you see that, for instance, the Louvre have 10 million visitors physically, and during the two months of confinement, they have 11 million visitors. Sure. Today, the only metrics of success of museums are the the real visitors, the, the, the foot visitors. It's not the virtue, it's not the, the, the digital visitors. Mm -hmm. But yeah. tomorrow, I think we have to take into account in uh, the metrics of success of museums, these new types of visitors, especially if we, we are going into a situation where because of confinement, whatever, we are limited to a certain number of persons for every uh, exhibition. It will be finished, the, uh, I think, for, at, for at, at least for a certain time. Yes. Uh, it will be finished, the uh, event exhibition, mm. with uh, thousands and thousands of people queuing. Yes. At least for a certain time, the museum will have to reinvent new metrics of success, yes. being based on the virtual visitor. And won't it have to reinvent models of, of funding in terms of the, 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 the digital world? Because, you know, museums have to survive. 
you will need to pay surely to be a virtual visitor to the Louvre just like you pay to be a physical visitor uh, if you get that shift towards online visits which in, is inevitable in the current situation with the virus but you know you're going to have to shift models otherwise there's a real problem with those museums being funded once again i'm totally convinced uh, that uh, the museum has to reinvent new uh, new economical new economical uh, models mm -hmm. you know if you look at the present situation there is no museum in the world, Louvre, Tate included, whatever you want, MoMA, Met, that no museum in the world which are capable to, I should say, uh, to balance their overheads with the revenue of their activity. They need patrons, they need funds. Mm. So by essence today, the, 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 the model cannot survive. It's yeah. finished we have to go to something different. Yeah. And I think that something different will be what we've seen in the others culture. Because once again, uh, we, we tend to forget that what happened now for, for the last, I should say, 20 years is more and more the art industry mm. is part of the leisure industry. Absolutely. And you see it reflected. And so, and so, and so they have to work with the same tools. Mm. And what is the tool of the leisure industry? Mm. <clears throat> it's to monetize the digital experience. Mm. Yes. Either you do it with like newspapers, in a kind of freemium experience. It means that uh, I will be, for instance, the Musée du Louvre, and I will offer you two rooms that you can visit free. And if you want to visit the three others, you will have to pay and you will have a, a curator uh, explaining the works. Either if you want to visit uh, the uh, exhibition of Da Vinci, you will pay for that. But to bring something like this, you have to bring a very, I shall say, very exciting content. And today the content for me is not, I, is a little bit boring. Because what, is, what the museums are trying to do at this moment mm. is just to replicate online what is offline. Yes. And this is not, this is not for me, the real way to do it. You have to create it's your, oh, another experience. Yes, it's your own, it's a different language. I mean, it really, it really is. I mean, with the, I mean, one of the ongoing issues with, with, the nature of looking and seeing artworks. Uh, I mean, in 2001, there was a study published by the Met Museum um, about the way people looked, how long people looked for. And visitors to the Louvre also were, were observed and how long they looked at the Mona Lisa for, which was on average, you know, 15 seconds or so. And I think, the nature of looking is seems to be changing but but further studies have shown that actually maybe it's not because the the met museum study of 2001 showed that the most frequent period of time at which people looked for at an individual work was about 10 seconds and a 2016 study by the same researchers followed up on this and they found that the time that mode that most frequent was still 10 seconds and in fact the mean and the median were much the same in 2016 as in 2001 so this would suggest that people aren't spending and this is in the physical experience that people aren't spending any less time looking but that they're looking differently because what those um, observations included was the the act of the selfie you know showing yourself in front of the artwork um, many older people will remember that this isn't entirely new, that uh, people being seen in front of landmarks, in front of objects, long before digital cameras on phones, is, is not a new experience, that, that, that it's just enabled more people to do it. And the social cachet of doing so is quite different. So 
I mean, one thing I really want to speak to you about is the nature of looking. So you have a physical collection, which you loan out. Where does the physical world and the digital world relate to that concept, do you think? You know, uh, uh, once again, uh, I speak from my experience and, you know, my experience is limited and I'm not the... I, I don't pretend to have any kind of expertise on, on, on that. What, what I've seen and what, what we've noticed because of all we, we've done, especially with the VR uh, experiences and uh, bringing people to, to try the VR, is that there is a, a big difference in the way uh, people uh, experience something in the digital and the real. There is a big difference. And they are not expecting to have the same uh, uh, the, 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 the same experience. And if they are expecting the same experience, they are very frustrated. Mm. You know, uh, you will always listen to someone telling that, ah, oh, you know, the uh, the digital will never replace the uh, the physical, and so and so and so. I need to look the, at the work in flesh, whatever. So once you look at things by just comparing i think you, you you're already on on the on the bad bad track to to make yourself have something uh, relevant as an experience mm. uh, today i think that once again i, I will take a very good example uh, of how i i see the digital uh, versus the real one a very good example which is for me a good example which is for me a, a kind of uh, of lighthouse in the way we, we, we look at things. Then I will tell you about a new project that we're doing. If you, let us take the, the music, music, let us take music. Yes. You can go to a concert, and I think uh, a lot of people go to concerts. And before the COVID, before this virus, all the concerts, uh, people, the artists were making a lot of money out of the concerts. Yes. You can also listen to, uh, the song through uh, streaming, like in uh, Deezer or Spotify. But where do people discover the song? It's on YouTube. Mm, yes. And, and the audience on YouTube is much, much bigger than the audience in, uh, in, in the concert or even in the streaming industry. And a, a, a video clip is everything, but not just the original. Because it's music, and it's, it's it's music, which is the original music, but it's visual, which is totally something new created. You mm -hmm. created to uh, to enhance the experience of of listening to a song, and I think that the digital has to do the same thing. We have to use the the digital to enhance an experience, to create something very different, but to create something which can be very memorable and which is part of our time. And it makes me go to a little bit what we're doing today. Uh, our next project, which is already a project, <coughs> will be a video game. We are uh, working on a video game. It will be released uh, at the end of the year. Uh, I'm doing a very strong homework with this video game because it's, it's a very interesting uh, idea because we have to find the right balance between a game and an art content if it's just about art content the gamers will not be interested if it's just a game the art content will lose its uh, i shall say its reasons to be inside yeah. yes so to take an example, which is an interesting example, we're working on concept like soft violence. Because most of the games, there is a kind of violence. There is a kind of adrenaline. Yes. You have to bring this kind of, I shall say, uh, this kind of ideas to make the game interesting. So we have to, to work on, on ideas, how we can bring a soft violence to a space where we will be, it will be another way for us to show the collection, 
and how we can do that in a way where it's still relevant for the collection. And why are we doing something like this? Because what we have noticed with this uh, convenient and all the uh, what happened on, on the online is that the, the way the, the screen is used by many, many people is very poor. The, real, the people today who have no ex the best to use a screen is the people from the video games. Yeah. Because they know how to bring interactivity, emotion, scalability, and they've already they are worked on monetizing uh, this use of a screen. Mm. And if I compare Fortnite, there was 250 million people. Yes. And Louvre had 10 million people. Yes. So I, 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 don't, I don't know if we would succeed, but I think that today we have to go into this direction. And, uh, and when we speak of the digital world, it's something which is moving very, very fast also. Yes. And we have to adapt ourselves to all the new types of digital worlds that we yeah. open from now yeah. to, to the next well, decade. I want, I want to pick up on one thing you've said there. So the way you describe the designers of video games could be lifted and applied to the artists themselves because you're thinking about means of communication, you're thinking of content, how that content can be read, and the way of getting through to your audience, your communication of the ideas, if you take that as, as a loose definition of, of the purpose of fine art, you know, that old idea of fine arts versus the, the, the crafts, the artisan production is about ideas. So in a way you're transforming the role of the artist into the role of the, the video games designer because all the same thoughts, all the same planning, use of aesthetics, proportion, composition, interactivity, well, it might be through sound and moving pictures, but it's the same thing. So do you think that the world of art creation is actually moving towards the world of video gamers? Are they our future's artists? We still need, but we still open, we also we need to open new doors. Mm. And especially the museums have to really work on the two sides, which are the digital and the real one. Because if they don't work on the two sides, they will not be able to find a way to survive. Yeah. Either because the audience will not be here, because they will find museums very boring. Either they will not find the right monetary system, monetary model to, to, to balance their, uh, you know, their overheads. I mean, what, one of the things in observing how people go around museums <clears throat> and take very fast pictures of the image, of the caption, of the text next to the image, and perhaps go out very, very quickly, I think it's easy to make an assumption that those people are just not really looking at the art, not, not really taking care. But there could be many experiences where that is the case, but they still go into the museums rather than just get a digital image. So for example, you might be there to gather um, pictures to send to someone. You might be a regular visitor yourself and just going into a gallery for a half an hour, an hour, quickly taking some pictures because there's somebody at a distance that you want to send the pictures to because you've got your own world going on and how you look. So I myself have gone into the National Gallery many times and you would think I was doing the same, but I'm, I'm just getting resources for teaching. So I, I know the pictures very, very well, but I might be going in and quickly taking some detailed photos that just gives me an image that I need and I'm using the resource as a live resource and then using it digitally. So if you take that as a, a, a way of doing things that you use the physical and convert it to the digital for specific purposes, not just showing I'm here, let's have a selfie. 
that people still want to do that when most of these paintings are now easily digitally available through the museum's own websites, through numerous things on Pinterest and so on. People are still going in to take photographs themselves, even if they don't take much time. So, I mean, that, that is also a new way of experiencing art, relatively new way of experiencing art, isn't it? Because, I mean, until fairly recently, you couldn't take photos, you couldn't take images, in, in many museums, you were told not to. So the digital world has actually changed that experience, even within the physical museum. And it doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't looking at the art. It could be all sorts of explanations. So that's not, that's not too much of a leap to what you've just said of the balance between the digital and the, and the physical experience that maybe this isn't as, as catastrophic as traditionalists might argue. So once again, every viewer will have a different experience and will have a different reaction. And it's very difficult to, you know, to, to, to give a, 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 a very, I shall say, a very uh, straight answer to all, to, to your questions. I think that once again, we live, first we live in a time where uh, you have to listen to the winds of changes and the weight of changes are also blowing because of technology. You like it or you don't like it, technology is molding, molding the new generation even more than us. Yes. And the new generation will be totally molded in a different way than we are in terms of emotion, in terms of aesthetic, you know. Uh, so what we are telling is uh, what we feel, what the historian are telling it's what they feel but they should listen uh, to uh, what is today the reality and what should be the reality in the next 10 years or 20 years. So I think it's a very difficult position today is to, 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 to say that uh, uh, we should look at art the way we looked at. Mm -hmm. I do believe that once again, you will have a mixture of an artwork and an experience. I think that the two will be together. Okay. Uh, so it's, so and, it's and, and to create the experience, I think, more and more, we will use digital tools yes. to enhance, to enhance, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the experience of, of the real one. Okay. Coming back to music, if you go to a concert today, you will see that there is the singer, but what is very important is how everything is presented with uh, screens behind, with lights, with, uh, with projection of films. So they create an experience mm. which was not at all like this 20 or 30 years yeah. ago, Before where everything. only the singer yeah. was on the stage. Yeah. So I think that's, once again, we, we have the mixture of the two. The only problem is how to have a balance. Mm. And what is, what is very important for me the crucial thing since 2005 when, when we went into this digital journey is always technology has to serve art and not art has to serve technology. In, in your answer you're talking about balance and balance would suggest that it's two-way that, that, that technology will serve art but maybe art will serve technology because if you get that balance logically speaking it should be it should be both ways so Maybe that's something that in itself, just in a, in a, a few years, is... is see, for instance, I'll be very direct with you. A very bad example of how art serves technology is uh, L'Atelier des Lumières. For me, it's a very bad example. Okay. And explain a little why. Yeah. But in the other one, a good example is Team Lab. Yes. So why do you think... Uh, Ardell Lumiere, why, why is that bad? Why, what, what do you think is not working? Because for me, they have privileged the experience, the funny experience, without any real creativity in terms of art. Yeah. In lab, there are people coming from the art world. Yes. And they, they, when and Shang, you know, there is many other artists who are today using this kind of 
of tools, but they are primary artists. Yes. And so they moved to this uh, new world, mm. keeping their, I shall say, their, uh, their knowledge, experience, and uh, their talents. So technology becomes the art, in short. This is why, and if you look at video games, it's incredibly creative video games. Yes, it is, indeed, yeah. It's incredible. It's much more, today, video games are much more creative than just videos. Do you think it's a bodily, a visceral experience in the way that visiting physical exhibitions can be? You can get physical reactions. If you're deeply engaged with the work, you get physical reactions. Do you think the virtual reality experience actually makes that physicality much more accessible to many more people? Because that's, that's what it would suggest to me. How, how do you conceive of it as, as its role? First, can I, before answering to the question, I, I would like to, uh, to tell you one of the artists that I'm very interested in today, I'm really following, we already collected works from her, is Lu Yang. Yes. Lu Yang is a very good example yes. of the kind of uh, new generation of artists who can move from a to total different types of fields. It can be, it can be music, it can be fashion, it can be video games, it can be uh, traditional uh, uh, painting, I shall say, experience. Lu Yang is a very good example of yeah. today what is done in this kind of, you know, new types of artworks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I personally, I had the chance to meet her. Uh, uh, and she's incredible. If, if, you, if you, you discuss with her, she, she's, I, I, don't, I, I don't say that she's a head because nobody's a head, but I think, She's already, she has already a foot in, in, in what seems to be the future for a certain type of art. It doesn't mean that in the future there will not be painters. There will be painters. Yes. But I think that the generation of the millennial will be also very interested to follow people like, like as you were young. Coming back to your question to VR, I think that for me, VR is a game changer. It's a game changer because for the first time, you are not looking at a screen. Because since the beginning, yes. you were looking at a screen in a cinema, yeah. you're looking at a computer, you're looking at your television. With VR, is about immersion, interaction, and this makes something very, very different. And there is no physical constraint. Mm. So you can create in VR, experiences that physically the person will feel being immersed in that you cannot do in augmented reality or in video or yeah. in film. So VR has the potential, has the potential to create very, very strong memorable experiences mm -hmm. because of all these, I shall say, these new ways that it can, I shall say, uh, impact a viewer. This virus has shown us that when we can get together, we still want to get together. Uh, a hard wiring is for social interaction, even if it's less than it was 10, 20 years ago, because we have other you know, ways. I, I, it's interesting, uh, you know Fortnite? Yes. It's a very interesting, uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting platform because people socialize on Fortnite, mm -hmm. but they are, digitally, uh, on, they are digitally present. And you know, they made concert on Fortnite. Mm -hmm. yep. and there was a huge, huge amount of people going to wait, go there and listen, went there and listen to the concert. And uh, so you see, once again, I, I come back to what I'm telling is that we are speaking of different types of realities. Which one? Everyone will exist in terms of if they are relevant as a museum, it will exist. If it's not relevant, it will disappear. Same thing with the digital world. But I just want to tell you something which is very interesting, that to show you a little bit how things are moving. My son uh, uh, and his wife just uh, 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 rent an apartment uh, in Paris because they moved from London to Paris. 
And you know what they bought? They bought a, a television called Frame from Samsung, where you can see artworks. Yes. And I was very surprised that they wanted to have something like this. And they said, no, because we were good to put artworks in it. Yes. And so it makes you also understand that it's not just about video games, but there is a lot of new ways mm. to connect people with art. Yes. And especially the more the screens will be good in terms of images, when you will have 8K images, where you will not be able to see the difference with a, a real artwork, because at the end, the eyes doesn't see the difference. Texture? Texture. Texture. No, texture, you have to, you know, texture. When you speak of texture, when you go to see the Mona Lisa, you don't see the texture. You can see the texture if you had, if you had at 50 centimeters. But so and many people find the Mona Lisa, visiting the Mona Lisa, a very disappointing experience because they can't get and see the texture. So that, that, that sort of feeds into that idea if you don't see but you the know, texture. Today, I can tell you, in VR and tomorrow with the 8K, okay, the texture for the eyes you will have you will feel the texture you will feel the texture so the technology will drive that the it will close the gap yeah yeah because texture is one of the most important senses i mean next to seeing understanding texture not you're not touching it but you 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 understand it you conceive of it you know it's there and therefore it's a visceral experience so you you feel that that texture will no longer be a uh, something that's absent in digital digital visits no it will not be a problem but there will still be a difference mm -hmm. between the biggest and the highest resolution image mm -hmm. with the personal with the real world mm -hmm. and you know what's the difference it's not the texture it's the idea that behind the real one there is a person yes yeah and when you look at a, a, a painting you look at the artist behind. You look at the human being having, having done the work. And the, the, when you look at a digital image, you will never have yes. this kind of emotion coming from a, a connection with a person. Yes. And also... This is a huge difference between... Yes. I, I, real I, I totally agree. And, and actually, the, the idea of space, I mean, it would have been inconceivable in the medieval world, late medieval, early modern world, that an altarpiece would mean anything except in its place in a church. And yet, with the advent of the museum in the 18th century, what, what, we, what is, became the modern museum is that things were, artworks were displaced from their original locations where the meaning of the art is constructed and put into a space that is not related to their meaning and yet the nature of looking is if you're worshipping at the altar of a great painting in a church you're also worshipping at the altar of a great painting in a museum and that sort of almost fetishistic experience of course was shown to be different but still there the nature of looking in fact in a museum you could argue you actually look harder sometimes because yeah you are being told it's important rather than coming across something in a church somewhere in a someone's stately home somewhere where you're not being directed towards it it's just living there and actually that that moment of looking is different as a museum but it's no less important in fact it's can be far more driven by by its it, its nature of this great work of art so if you look at technology in the same way that perhaps technology is the nature of seeing something in its space because wherever you are it's the art space because you're immersed in that world whereas in a museum you've got something that's often dislocated you always dislocated from its space i mean it's, it's a bit i mean it's a fascinating debate and 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 i think that the people now who were maybe born in the 60s and 70s who have experienced this revolution 
in the way that people experienced printing and the, the nature of printed books and publication and the vernacular languages in the early uh, 16th century, we're going through something akin to that right now and Victorian, sorry, 19th century changes that, that speed of change and the, of the nature of the modern world, the retail environment. Personally, my, my concern today, my concern, it's once again, you know, it's always uh, what we, when I speak is just my own experience. Uh, I feel uh, uncomfortable today with what's happening in the art world. I think there is a huge gap on how I perceive the society in which we are living, the art which also is already is produced today by a certain number of artists the art that the audience is looking for and what is today the uh, the status of the art market if you look at the art market most of the favors of the day are artists who have been successful in the 60s 70s yeah. 50 yeah. years ago uh, who uh, are making huge, huge prices when young artists of the generation of our generation of the generation of today did not can even do a living on that. Yeah. And and for me, uh, I'm feeling comfortable by this situation. I think that uh, today, when when I see that uh, there is such a, a fracture between uh, how people perceive uh, through the, uh, I shall say, through the eyes of uh, the dollar, what is a successful artist, uh, I feel uncomfortable. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I think people can buy whatever they want with what the money they want. It's not my problem. And I, I, if they want to do it and they're happy to do it, it's, it's okay for me. But I feel that more than ever, and I've been collecting for 35 years now, more than ever, I feel a huge gap between what is today a, a relevant art world and what is today uh, considered as a successful. A successful mm. I mean, th those very artists you're talking about, bar, bar one or two exceptions who are you know, very rich in their own lifetimes. Of course, they started the way that the artists you're, you're discussing now, the, the young artists working today, they've started that way. And it's only either later on in their careers or after they've died that the big prices have gone into the market. However, what I think the virtual world, new technologies in general, and within that, obviously what, you, what you're doing personally, um, is changing the model of, of the potential for success. I think that we are living in a time where, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a very strange time. I think it's a very difficult time mm. uh, because, you know, th there is two ways to look at things today. Uh, either you, you think that the future will be a new normal. It means that you will reef, reef it would be possible to find again a kind of normality uh, where predict where you can predict things mm -hmm. with a certain visibility. This is a new, the new normal, and there is another way is to the post normal, and uh, and for me the post normal is a, is a world where it's unpredictable, chaotic, but in. I believe that we are a little bit in this post-normal time, but in this post-normal time, which is like a big chaos, there's a lot of things to do.